Hey family, help me to reach 1000 subscribers. We are very close, let's continue the video. For many of us who are personally unaffected by the harsh brutality of murder, the concept seems abstract and distant. It's a hard pill to swallow knowing that there are people out there capable of horrendous and terrifying crimes. But it's a cold, hard truth that we all know deep down. While most of the monsters who commit such acts of violence will be apprehended, there is an abundance of criminals who will not. Whether it's because they are faceless, nameless culprits, or worse still, those already identified but have somehow escaped justice. Criminal cases are not always so straightforward. In August 1998, a woman calling herself Diana Ray placed an ad in a Louisiana paper. She claimed to be green-eyed, blonde, honest, and hardworking. However, the real woman behind the ad was anything but. Her actual name was Hazel Leota Head, but she also had an abundance of aliases and was a drifter who hitchhiked around the USA, searching for lonely well-off men to fund the lifestyle that she craved and had grown accustomed to. Hazel would often bleed these men of their money before moving on and searching for her next victim. That year, Hazel, still going by the name Diana, met Charles Barker, a man who had been recently widowed after his wife of 11 years was killed in a car accident by a drunk driver. Charles had been on his own for less than a year and spent most of his time attempting to fill the void that his wife left. Initially, he tried traveling, fishing, and sailing but found that he disliked spending his time alone. Then he began to partake in gambling, which is where he met Diana. It's speculated by authorities that he likely thought he met the middle-aged woman by chance. But in reality, she had targeted him. The romance quickly blossomed between them, and just days after the pair had met, she'd moved into his home. At first, Charles's children were delighted that he'd met someone. But then, upon meeting Diana, they changed their minds. One daughter, in particular, Jennifer, claimed she thought her father's new girlfriend was suspicious and quickly believed that the woman was only after Charles's money. It wasn't long until he too believed this. Several weeks later, Charles told another of his daughters, Cindy, that he was having issues with his new girlfriend. It seemed that the honeymoon phase was quickly coming to an end. Charles didn't elaborate too much on what the exact problems were between the couple, and he said that he'd call his daughter again in a few days. When he didn't, his children became concerned. Jennifer took charge and tried to arrange to see her father. But when she received no answer from him for over a week, she reached out to Charles's sister, June, who lived nearby, to check on him. June and her husband agreed and were uneasy when they visited the home on September 2, 1998, finding that the front door was unlocked and open. Charles Barker was slumped over in the kitchen, having suffered a fatal gunshot wound to the back of the head. According to medical reports, he'd been dead for five days. At first glance, the home appeared to be relatively untouched. There was no sign of a struggle, and nothing was upturned. However, in the bedroom, it was discovered that the safe in which Charles kept a large sum of money, approximately $45,000, had been opened, and the contents were now missing. The murder weapon, which was the victim's own .25 caliber handgun, was found on a table in the master bedroom. It had been wiped clean of prints. The only other things missing from the home were Charles's Lincoln Town car and his girlfriend, Diana Ray. Shortly after the murder, Charles's car was found in the parking lot of Shreveport Airport in Louisiana, where Diana's clothes and DNA revealed her true identity as Hazel Leota Head. A background check run by police established that Hazel had been married at least ten times and that she had a long list of aliases. There was already a warrant out for her arrest in Lincoln, Nebraska, pertaining to the burning down of her ex-boyfriend's mobile home in 1991 after which she went on the run from authorities. Hazel Leota Head was born on December 10, 1949. If alive today, she would be 70 years old. She is described as being blonde and green-eyed, standing 5 feet 2 inches tall, and weighing between 120 and 150 pounds. Although with age, she could have gained weight 
and changed her hair color. She has a scar near her right eye and a gap between her front teeth. She often takes jobs in waitressing and travels with truck drivers across the country. She is known to smoke, drink vodka, frequent casinos, and place personal ads in newspapers. She moves frequently between cities and towns. Sadly for the family of Charles Barker, there have been no confirmed sightings of Hazel since December 1998 at a truck stop near Wheatridge, Colorado, where she applied for a waitressing position. She may have ties there. Her case was featured on Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted, but neither propelled the investigation or the hunt for her any further forward. Michael Lewis Klein and his 18-year-old fiancé, Joe Ellen Weigel, had been together for about a year in 1970 and had both recently graduated from Lee's Summit High School in Missouri. A seemingly ordinary couple, Michael came from a rich, prominent family, while Joe came from a working-class background. Despite their differences in wealth and status, the pair appeared to be happy together, and nobody suspected the darkness looming beneath the surface of their relationship. On the night of the 2nd of July 1970, the couple had arranged a date. While it's unclear where exactly the couple went, whether to dinner, the movies, or somewhere else, it's known that the two had a rather heated argument before they left the location, and the fight lasted for about 20 minutes. There are no details regarding what the pair argued about, but it seems they left together. Joe had plans to stay overnight at a friend's house after the date. But when she didn't come home the following day, her family grew concerned. They contacted the friend she was meant to be staying with and then called Michael. He gave differing accounts of her whereabouts, at first saying that the couple had married and she'd gone to visit a relative. But he changed his story when that relative told Joe's parents she wasn't with them. At this point, Michael said he didn't know where she went. The family then contacted the police, but were told that a missing persons report couldn't be filed at that time. Just days later, on the 5th of July, Joe's partially clothed body was found floating in Lake Winnebago by water skiers. The 18-year-old was clad in a girdle, pantyhose, and part of a dress, and was recovered with fishnet around her body. She'd been weighed down with a concrete block and water jugs. Joe's death grew more disturbing when her autopsy showed that she'd been four months pregnant at the time. Her case was ruled a homicide, as she'd been strangled to death. A ski rope tied around her legs was identical to the rope found on the Klein family speedboat, and it was established that the concrete block used to weigh down the body was from the home of one of Michael's friends. In Michael's car, they found Joe's hair wrapped in a towel. It had been forcibly pulled from the roots. The same day Joe's body was found, Michael Pine had left on a student trip to Europe and Israel, and he returned on July the 9th. He was immediately questioned by authorities but, taking the advice of his attorney, was neither cooperative nor forthcoming with any information. It seemed the public took this as a sign of guilt, and on the 24th of July, a grand jury indicted Michael for Joe's murder, but he disappeared before he could be arrested. Authorities believe that due to the power and influence of his family, Michael attended university under an assumed name in the early 70s and is now working in the medical field, possibly as a vet. It is widely believed that the Klein family helped their son escape justice, and unsubstantiated rumors suggest that Michael could be living in Latin America. Joe Wigler's overnight bag has never been recovered, and her parents have since passed away without ever seeing their daughter's killer prosecuted. No date of birth is given for Michael, but if alive today, he is likely in his late 60s as he graduated from high school at the same time as Joe. At the time of his disappearance, he was 5 foot 9, weighed 130 pounds, with brown hair and hazel eyes. It's unknown what happened to the remainder of Michael's family, but his father passed away in 1988 and did not give any indication of his son's whereabouts prior to his death. The case of Joe Wiglow was featured on Unsolved Mysteries, but tragically, Michael Lewis Klein continues to go unapprehended. Born on January 1, 1999, 
Samantha Kibala was the daughter of Michael and Dan, who had been married for two and a half years and resided in New York. The couple had gotten married after just nine months of dating, and all appeared to be well between the two. Prior to the birth of their daughter, there seemed to be no bitter feuds or unpleasantness between them. However, this all changed when Samantha came along. Almost immediately, just weeks after the birth, Dan began to behave erratically. She reportedly yelled at her husband, Michael, telling him that she didn't need him anymore. Michael came home from work the following day to find that all their furniture was gone, and Samantha's room had been cleared out. There wasn't a trace of her left. Extremely worried for the safety of his child, Michael phoned his mother-in-law. She answered the phone and told him that their marriage was over, and he would never see his daughter again. She then went on to explain to him that she called the police and said that he had beaten and abused both and then their daughter. According to Michael, when in filed for divorce, she dragged out the proceedings and hired and fired a variety of advisors. Reportedly, she hired 23 different lawyers and 11 different psychiatrists. In retaliation, Michael sued for divorce and full custody of Samantha. This sour exchange stretched on with the pair sharing custody as the case went through the legal system. After a week-long visit to her mother, Samantha was returned to her father with facial bruising. Understandably angry and upset, Michael took her to a pediatrician who said that the bruising had occurred in the last three to five days, meaning it had happened while Samantha was in the care of her mother. Soon, a court-appointed psychiatrist evaluated the pair's fitness as parents. Still, it was not determined how the bruises on Samantha's face occurred. The professional did, however, describe Anne's relationship with her daughter as odd, although no further details were given as to why. Over the course of the following 11 months, Anne took Samantha to seven different doctors on 33 different occasions. While it's unknown what symptoms or reasoning was given for each appointment, it seemed obvious to doctors that, and was showing classic signs of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a psychological disorder marked by attention-seeking behavior exhibited by a caregiver towards those in their care. It is often seen in mothers. The sufferer gains attention by seeking medical help for exaggerating or made-up symptoms for their child. Despite the somewhat obvious signs that and was displaying, experts diagnosed her as having a severe personality disorder with a mixture of traits from other conditions. As a result of this concerning diagnosis, it seems and was deemed unfit to care for her child alone, and Michael was then given full custody of Samantha, and quickly appealed this decision, and it was determined by the legal system that she had a right to still see her daughter via visitations. However, this is not where the story ends. On February 3, 2001, Things took a sinister turn when Michael dropped Samantha off at the police station for a scheduled overnight stay with Anne. When he came to collect his daughter the following day, either Samantha nor her mother showed up. They had disappeared. Two months later, in April, Anne's SUV was discovered abandoned in a Brooklyn parking garage. There were no clues inside that indicated either party's whereabouts. Michael has not seen his daughter or estranged wife since and Kibala is wanted for kidnapping, unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, custodial interference, and unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. She and her daughter may have been traveling with a 12-pound red mini spaniel dog named Vodka. At the time of her disappearance, and was 5 foot, weighed 120 pounds, with brown hair and blue eyes. She may have cut her hair short and dyed it blonde since then and she is known to wear glasses when driving. Her date of birth is March 25, 1963, meaning she would be 56 years old today, and has an accounting degree from Brooklyn College and previously worked in that field. She has a dental condition for which she may seek treatment, and she is likely in contact with medical professionals. She may use the surnames Yermak, Sol, or Kaplan, it is believed by authorities that Anne had been purchasing prepaid calling cards at a convenience store for months prior to the abduction of her daughter, as her mobile phone and credit cards have not been used since the disappearance. 
Samantha Kabbalah was just two years old at the time she went missing. If alive today, she will soon be turning 21. When she disappeared, she had light brown hair and brown eyes. It is suspected that the mother and daughter may be in New York City, Palm Beach County, or Boynton Beach, Florida, Illinois, or New Hampshire. In 2006, the pair was possibly sighted in Santa Fe, New Mexico. While it's not confirmed, the witness is believed to be credible. Samantha was described as being quiet and withdrawn, and it was reported that her mother didn't interact with her much. Michael Cabela believes that Anne's mother is helping to hide his daughter, as she has refinanced her house multiple times. He still searches for his daughter and believes she was being homeschooled when she was younger, as he has never found her enrolled in any school system. It's been 18 years since he last saw his child, but tragically there have been no new leads in the case despite being featured on the TV shows Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted. Brian Dylan Ninsfield was just 18 years old in January of 1997. A freshman at Roger Williams University in Bristol, Rhode Island, Brian was enjoying his second semester and was described as being quiet with few friends. After enduring his parents' divorce when he was younger, he and his parents agreed upon Roger Williams University as his school of choice, as it boasted a home-like atmosphere. Brian often found himself homesick while attending his architecture course. In his downtime, he enjoyed reading and listening to music by the water beneath Mount Hope Bridge, and he is known to have been overwhelmed by the school's academics, struggling somewhat to keep on top of his studies. On January 31st, Brian's life slowly began to unravel when he received a disturbing phone call from a former Roger Williams University student who claimed he was going to get him and informed him that he could still access campus. After the call at around 12.30 a.m., Brian phoned his father, requesting that he come down to the university. His father, in turn, told him to call campus security, whose only advice was to change his phone number. A week later, on February 6th, Brian finished his literature class and was never seen again. His parents were not alerted that their son was missing until February 12th. His room remained undisturbed when his parents arrived, but his mother, Marianne, found Sam in his bed, which caused her concern since Brian was very clean and tidy. At some point shortly after he went missing, Marion received a call from a woman who claimed to be associated with the school and said that a staff administrator and two faculty staff members were withholding information about Brian and the case. However, the line then went dead. Nothing further has come of this lead, and the woman on the other end of the phone has never been identified. Six months later, in September, Labor Day weekend, a mother and daughter walking along the Hog Island Beach located a few miles from Brian's school stumbled across the ghastly discovery of a shoe on the shore, which contained part of a foot inside. DNA showed that the limb belonged to Brian, as did a shinbone that was found nearby. No other remains have ever been found, and the student was presumed dead upon the gruesome discovery. Eventually, the man who'd made the threatening phone calls to Brian was identified. He was a former student named Josh Cohen and was pointed out by campus officials. While Josh and Brian were friends during Brian's first semester, it has been suggested that the two were romantically involved, although no one can say for certain. It's alleged that the relationship ended just weeks before Brian's disappearance. While Cohen admitted to making the phone calls, he claimed they were all in jest. Authorities do not believe that Josh Cohen is involved with Brian's disappearance. There are several theories regarding the case of Brian Ninsfield. Some speculate he accidentally fell into the river beneath Mount Hope Bridge, or that perhaps he jumped from the bridge itself. His parents believe their son fell victim to foul play and that Cohen, who made the distressing phone calls, was responsible. Another theory put forward by online investigators is that perhaps Cohen was going to come forward about their relationship, and Brian committed suicide as a result, as he was unhappy or uncomfortable with the decision. 
Brian's parents largely blamed Roger Williams University for failing to notify them when their son vanished. As the first 24 hours are so precious in a missing person's case, they felt they'd have had a better chance of finding Brian alive had they been alerted sooner. His father Stephen said, I remember just this uncaring, unsympathetic, unconcerned attitude by the university. Stephen and Marianne later went on to sue the school, although it's uncertain if they won their case or not. They also pushed for a national law requiring faster parental notification when a student goes missing. Roger Williams University's attitude was shady at best in the case of Brian Ninsfield. Reportedly, someone from the admissions office told the university tour guides that if anyone asked about the missing student, they were to say that he was safe at home with his parents. There were also several claims that people at the university were subtly discouraged from coming forward with information, although it's unknown how exactly, and staff were told not to answer any questions a student may have about the case. There appears to be little that was done in relation to Brian's case, and his disappearance was mostly swept under the rug by his school and by local police. It's unknown why it went largely ignored by officials, but until they step up to take action, it's likely Brian's disappearance may never be solved. Nineteen years old at the time of her disappearance and subsequent death, Teresa Allor was staying at Champlain College in Lenoxville, Quebec, Canada, and was a clever and well-rounded girl. On Friday, November the 3rd, 1978, Teresa reportedly had plans to study and work on a book report for her college course. She told friends this and made plans to meet with them around 9 p.m. that night. However, she never showed up. When she was reported missing, police brushed the teen's disappearance off as a simple runaway. This initial lack of interest in Teresa's case set a precedent that continued over the course of her disappearance and her later murder. Teresa's body was found on April the 13th, 1979, by a Muscat trapper six months after she was reported missing. Her jewelry and watch were still on her body, as was her clothing. She was located in Compton in a small body of water, about one kilometer from her dormitory residence there. The on-scene coroner reported seeing signs of strangulation on the 19-year-old's body, but a cause of death could not be established. So, police assumed that it was drug-related, possibly an overdose, and that Teresa's fellow college students had panicked and dumped her body instead of calling for help. That said, no drugs were found in her system, but police were disturbingly dismissive of the idea that foul play had occurred. Very little investigation was done into the case of Teresa Law, and it was later found that her clothing had been destroyed just five years after her body was discovered. In the summer of 2002, Teresa's family enlisted the help of a friend and investigative reporter who wrote several articles outlining and presenting the evidence that showed that the student was murdered and was not a victim of an accidental overdose. The journalist also pointed out the possible link to two unsolved cases that had taken place in Quebec. One was of 10-year-old men in Dub in March 1978, and the other was of Louise Cameron in 1977. Manon went missing two months prior to the discovery of her body and was found dead, fully clothed in March in a block of ice miles from where she was last seen. She had been painstakingly removed from the substance with a hatchet, and her cause of death remains undetermined. While police speculated that she'd been hit by a car, there was no evidence to prove it. Louise went missing on March the 23rd, 1977, and was found two days later naked, but for the shoelace around her neck. Her clothes had been left next to her body, and she'd been sexually assaulted before she was strangled. Both cases remain unsolved, but an FBI consultant backed the idea that the two girls were linked with Teresa's death. They suggested that a serial sexual predator was active in the Quebec area during the 70s and advised police to investigate all three murders together. Several of the women were also named in these links. In 2004, Quebec's cold case unit was created, and 15 years later in 2019, Montreal followed suit. However, there appear to be no new leads in any of the cases of the three girls mentioned. Teresa's brother John, 
who was just 14 at the time of his sibling's death, is one of the biggest advocates for seeking justice in Teresa's case and the other possibly linked women and girls. He last saw his sister boarding a train to head to college and had given her a Styx album for her birthday. In John's research on the case, he came across an abundance of missing women from the 70s and beyond. Reportedly, many of the cases carry similar elements. For example, many have found nude or semi-nude, have been sexually assaulted, show signs of strangulation, and the use of a vehicle is involved. The only brief suspect in Teresa's case is barely a suspect at all. Online spectators proposed that the man who was in charge of the student's residence was somehow involved. He was never questioned and disappeared shortly after the murder. The residence was then shut down by the college despite the ongoing housing shortage. The man has never been identified, and his absence never explained. It's uncertain why the residence was later closed. Teresa Allor's case remains unsolved. Born Betsy Ruth Arts Mayer on July the 11th, 1947, in Holland, Michigan, the 22-year-old student was barely into adulthood when her life was cut short. Betsy was one of four children in her family and initially studied English and art at the University of Michigan before enrolling at Pennsylvania University after she graduated. Her long-term boyfriend, David Wright, was a medical school student at the university, speaking fondly of his deceased girlfriend. David recalls many years later how he wondered what would have happened had Betsy stayed with him on the weekend she was murdered. He had plans to marry her. On November the 20th, 1969, she was in the library doing research for a paper when she was spotted collapsed on the floor by fellow students. Bystanders began to perform CPR on the young woman, thinking that she'd suffered some sort of seizure or had otherwise passed out. The campus hospital was contacted, and by 5.59 p.m., an ambulance had transported Betsy to the Ridenau Health Center where she was pronounced dead a short time later. It wasn't until doctors examined the 22-year-old that they realized that she'd been stabbed once through the left breast. Not only was she wearing a red dress which concealed her blood, but she also bled out into her lungs, leaving very little of the substance around the wound. Authorities who later investigated the murder concluded that Betsy had likely been stabbed from behind as her hands and arms sported no defensive injuries. They theorized she was also likely familiar with her killer and didn't fear him. Reportedly, just several minutes following Betsy's stabbing, Either one or two men left the library telling the clerk, Somebody better help that girl. One witness claimed there was only one blonde man. It's unknown whether it was one or two men, and in either case, he or they remain unidentified. On the back of the police began their investigation and held 5,000 interviews in the course of it. They made no arrests and pinned down few suspects. Nobody seemed to have a bad word to say about Betsy and she was described as smart and good-natured with no known enemies. Once David Wright, her boyfriend, was considered a person of interest initially, he was quickly ruled out when their good relationship was vouched for by those who knew the couple. According to friends, he didn't leave the study group he was in on the day of the murder, providing him with a rock-solid alibi. Witnesses were far between in Betsy's case. Some reported hearing a scream, while others told of the sound of falling books or shelves, likely from when the student collapsed among the stacks in the library. Consequently, three drawings were released of witnesses that police could track down, but unfortunately, these illustrations were highly generic, and it appears that the witnesses were never found. The murder weapon was also never recovered, leaving investigators with little to go on. To make matters worse, the murder scene had actually been cleaned up by a janitor after Betsy was taken to the hospital, leaving police with even less to work with, as any crime scene clues were now gone. Despite the lack of leads or information, police did eventually find several suspects. An early suspect in the case was a man named Robert Durgey, a 27-year-old English professor who died in a car crash in Michigan about three weeks after the murder. He was investigated and cleared, 
although it's unknown what drew him into the eye of the police as a person of interest in the first place. It was also briefly speculated that the infamous Ted Bundy was responsible for the killing as he'd attended Temple University in Pennsylvania in 1969 and was a frequent visitor to university libraries. However, he was also ruled out. Another fleeting suspect was some kind of military man given the precision of the wound. It was later theorized that perhaps he had stumbled upon a gay couple or encounter and was killed so that she wouldn't tell of anything she'd witnessed. This was thought because when a black light was used on the area where she was found, it revealed human bodily fluids, but the stacks were notorious for couples doing drugs and having sex. So it couldn't really be determined that Betsy had seen anything. The biggest suspect in the case was a man named Richard Hefner, sometimes referred to as Rick. Just hours after the murder, before the news broke, Hefner went to the home of his Penn State professor and asked if they had heard the news about Betsy. It seems that Richard had dated the 22-year-old woman for a brief time, and Hefner told police that their relationship came to an end in October of 1969. This, despite the fact that at the time, Betsy had been dating David Wright, and they'd been discussing marriage. Hefner told authorities that he didn't know of the murder until the day after it had occurred, contradicting the account that he'd gone to his professor's home to tell of the news of her death. Despite the suspicious circumstance around Hefner, he was never investigated any further. Worryingly, those who knew him referred to him as associate. He reportedly once drove 800 miles to proclaim his love to a woman he barely knew on her doorstep. He also once punctured a neighbor's tire with a knife and threw dog waste through another neighbor's car window. Six years later in 1975, Hefner was arrested for molesting a 13-year-old boy, but the trial resulted in a hung jury. After this, he had frequent run-ins with the law. In 1992, he was accused of inappropriate behavior with a child. In 1998, he was charged with assaulting a woman in a parking lot, which resulted in the victim receiving a dislocated jaw and loosening several teeth. It's widely believed by online spectators and crime authors that Hefner was responsible for the murder of his one-time girlfriend. Although it's unknown why he seemed to switch from harming women to young boys, an odd leap to say the least. According to Hefner's nephew, he overheard his mother shout, You killed that girl, and now you're killing me. The nephew firmly believes that Hefner was responsible for Betsy's murder. Hefner died in 2002, and it's unknown to this day if he really was behind the killing. Betsy Artsman's family never received justice for their daughter, and her former boyfriend David Wright still thinks about what could have been. Betsy's case remains unsolved 50 years later. Thursday, February 11, 1897, should have been a perfectly ordinary day for 33-year-old housekeeper, Elizabeth Annie Camp. Elizabeth had gone to visit her elder sister in Hansel that day, staying for approximately two hours and had done some shopping for her upcoming wedding before heading for the 7.42 p.m. train back to Waterloo. Elizabeth's fiancé, Edward Berry, a fruiter, was waiting for her arrival at the other end of her journey. Barry was early for the 8.25 p.m. arrival of the train, and as he waited on the platform and passengers began to alight, he scanned the crowds for his fiancée. When he couldn't locate her, he wondered if they'd missed each other or if she had gone outside to wait for him. About to turn away, Barry noticed a commotion some distance away. Police shortly accompanied a small group of railway workers. Curious and likely feeling a slight sense of panic, Barry approached the group to ask what had happened, only to be told that a carriage cleaner had seen the legs of a woman protruding from beneath a seat in a second-class carriage. The woman dead was partially concealed under the seat. The body was taken to St. Thomas Hospital where Edward Barry formally identified it as his bride-to-be. It didn't take doctors long to establish a cause of death. Elizabeth's body had been repeatedly bashed and inside the carriage was a horrifying amount of blood. Superintendent Robinson of London South and Western Railway and Chief Inspector Marshall of Scotland Yard worked together to head the investigation. 
It was determined that there was no sexual assault, and so investigators quickly ruled out that the murder was sexually motivated. However, they found that Elizabeth's pockets had been rifled through and that her purse with a small amount of money inside was missing, suggesting that the intended purpose was robbery. Elizabeth's train ticket, which she'd had when boarding, was also missing, although it's possible it was in her purse and was not taken intentionally. However, Elizabeth still wore her brooch and earrings, so it's unknown if the killer was simply in a panic or hurry, or if there really was an ulterior motive and the scene was staged. Investigating officers recreated the circumstances of the crime and found that Elizabeth had likely fought back against her attacker. A well-built woman, fear spread when news broke out of the murder. Women wondered whether it was safe for them to travel alone by train. After all, if someone as formidable as Elizabeth Camp could be overpowered, then surely anyone else had very little chance. According to Elizabeth's sister, a porter who helped her with her parcels, the carriage that she'd entered had been empty when she did so, meaning the killer had to have gotten on at some point during the other stops on the journey. The only clues found in the compartment were an umbrella later identified as Elizabeth's and a pair of bone cufflinks although some sources say only one cuff link was recovered. As investigators searched the tracks for clues, they came across a large chemist's pistol on an embankment between Putney and Wandsworth. The pistol was stained with blood, and hairs were attached to it. Doctors reported that this could have been the murder weapon given the limited capabilities of forensic science in 1897. However, no fingerprints or DNA traces could be lifted from the pistol. Police found several suspects in the case of Elizabeth Camp. The landlord who owned the pub that she worked in denied any rumors that she had rejected him, and a former fiancé was looked into but found to have a solid alibi. A lot of weight was placed in the fact that Elizabeth was lending money to friends and family members, and her brother-in-law was investigated and asked to account for his movements on the night that she was murdered. The most compelling piece of evidence, however, came from a pastry chef who'd been a passenger on the train. Joining at Chiswick, the chef told police that at one's worth, a man departed hurriedly. He was described as being of medium height, about 30 years old, with a dark mustache, top hat, and a frock coat. Two porters on the train confirmed also seeing a man resembling the given description, but he was never traced. Ultimately, Police couldn't connect any of their suspects with either the murder weapon or the train. An inquest ran for six weeks, and the jury returned a verdict of willful murder by persons unknown. 122 years later, the murder of Elizabeth Annie Camp remains unsolved. Born on October 31, 1840, Franz Müller was a German tailor who is now famous for carrying out the first killing on a British train in 1864. Müller's victim was 69-year-old Thomas Briggs, who worked as a banker and left behind a wife and daughter upon his death. On July 9, 1864, Briggs was beaten into unconsciousness and robbed while traveling on the 9.50 p.m. North London Railway train from Fenchurch Street to Chalk Farm. At 10.11 p.m., Two bank clerks entered the carriage only to find a pool of blood, to which they alerted the train guard. Ten minutes later, a train driver going in the opposite direction saw a body on an embankment next to the tracks between Old Bow and Hackney Wick Station. It was found that the body was of Thomas Briggs, and he'd been thrown from the train. Missing from him were his gold eyeglasses, his gold watch, and a gold chain. However, five pounds was left in his pocket. Although Briggs was rushed to a public house where a doctor attended to him, he later died at home from his wounds the following night. He had sustained multiple head lacerations and a skull fracture. Found inside the cabin Briggs had been in was a walking cane, covered in blood, leading investigators to speculate over whether this was the murder weapon or not, along with his bag. Police also found a black beaver hat that they initially thought was the victim's. However, it was later established that it belonged to the killer. On July 18th, a cab driver named Matthews came forward with his suspicions about Franz Mueller. Mueller had previously been engaged to Matthews's eldest daughter, 
and he had recently come to his house with a gold chain in a box. While he did attach the chain to his own watch, he noticed that the box was sold by a jeweler in Cheapside. Authorities went to investigate the shop owned by John Death. Death confirmed that he had indeed had Franz Mueller inside of his store on July 11th. Police had obtained a photo of him from Matthews and that Mueller had exchanged a gold chain for a cheap chain as well as a ring. Matthews also confirmed that the beaver had belonged to Mueller, stating that he was the one who actually bought it for him. Police issued an arrest warrant and then went to Mueller's home where his landlady again confirmed that the hat belonged to Mueller. She also told authorities that he'd left on July 14th and that he did not act suspicious when he came home the night of the 9th. There was no blood on his clothes when she washed them, she claimed. Investigators found out that Mueller had boarded a ship to New York, and they promptly followed suit on July 20th in pursuit of him. The ship arrived three weeks before Mueller did, and when he arrived on August 25th, he was arrested. Briggs's gold watch and hat were found on him. He'd altered the latter in an attempt to disguise himself, it seemed. Mueller was extradited to the UK where he stood trial. He maintained his innocence throughout, claiming he was elsewhere during the murder, including at a brothel. Several witnesses were brought forward by the defense, and it was claimed that Mueller had obtained the items from a man at the docks. The jury did not buy this and took only 15 minutes to find him guilty of murder on October 20th. Mueller was publicly hanged outside of Newgate Prison in London on November 14. A crowd of 50,000 spectators watched on. Reportedly before being hanged, he told a German-speaking pastor, I did it, when he was asked if he was responsible. Mueller's hanging was one of the last public executions carried out in England. Although Briggs's murder was undoubtedly a horrible and needless one, it did provide more solutions for keeping passengers safe on their railway journeys. As a result of the death, the communication cord was implemented in all trains, and carriages with corridors were created. On the 3.25 p.m. South Anton to Reading train on Monday, June 29, 1964, a 12-year-old boy went to the toilet only to witness the grisly and frightening sight of the body of a murdered teen. Frightened, the boy ran off screaming and alerted a passenger who pulled on the communication cord just as the train was leaving Basingstoke. The victim, 15-year-old Yvonne Laker, was on her way back to boarding school, having boarded at Southampton. Her father was an RAF serviceman stationed in Singapore, and Yvonne had been staying with her grandparents over the weekend. They ultimately were the ones to formally identify her body. Yvonne's blue holder was found in the middle of the train, while her shoes and barrette were found the following day along the track, 10 miles south of Basingstoke. The teenager hadn't been sexually assaulted but was brutally bashed on the back of the head with a glass bottle and had her throat cut with its broken remains. Glass shards and copious amounts of blood littered the crime scene. Investigators suspected Yvonne had been killed just after Winchester, one of the seven stops made on the journey. At this time, the train was almost empty. The only clue found in the case of Yvonne Laker was a brown paper bag with a reinforced bottom like that a wine merchant would carry. A greaseproof bread wrapper was inside, as well as four biscuits and a tin manufactured by Marks and Spencer. Despite police's attempts to identify the owner, no one ever came forward to claim the bag, and so it's suspected it belongs to the murderer. During the investigation, 40 out of 60 passengers promptly came forward and were subsequently cleared. The only suspect in Yvonne's death was a 27-year-old married father of three who'd been arrested for motoring charges and had mentioned being on the train at the time of the murder. Green glass matching that from the crime scene was found in the pockets of the unidentified man but he claimed not to know how it got there. Accounting for his movements of the day, the man said he had gone to Basingstoke Labor Exchange and then a pub in Church Street. He then boarded the wrong train, intending to go to a Royal Marines recruitment office in Winchester but had gotten on the reading-bound service instead. The man was brought to trial on November 23, 1964. A reporter said the defendant had gotten into the same compartment 
as Yvonne. The defendant maintained that another man committed the crime, describing him as 5 foot 9, wearing a sports jacket, white shirt, and tie. According to the defendant, he witnessed the man steadying Yvonne with an arm around his shoulder, asking him what was wrong. The man claimed she is being sick. He then added that he didn't see the pair together after that, but he did see the man reemerge from the toilet alone. When the defendant asked if he could do anything, he was told by the man to mind your own business. A series of witnesses confirmed seeing a man acting suspiciously near the track before he ran off, and one even claimed that the man on trial was not the same man that he had seen. More than six hours later, a jury acquitted the defendant of the murder. However, he had allegedly torched four barns in North Hampshire and set fire to furniture in a house in Basingstoke and was later jailed for 18 months in relation to one barn and the furniture. No other suspects were ever identified, and it's unknown what really went on the day that Yvonne Laker was murdered. Her case remains unsolved. A social activist, resistance fighter, and survivor of two Nazi concentration camps, Countess Harish Lubyanska, was no stranger to the more macabre side of life. Born in April of 1884, she was a member of a noble family in southeastern Poland and, as an adult, went on to marry a count from a once powerful clan, where she lived with him on his estate until the Boskovic Uprising of 1918. This uprising saw the family's estate being seized, and her husband was stabbed to death. Teresa fled with their son to Warsaw where he then joined the army and died in 1939 when the Nazis invaded Poland. In defiance, Teresa joined the resistance and was later caught with escaped prisoners in her house. Consequently, she was sent to Auschwitz and then moved to Ravensbrück concentration camp. When she was later released, Teresa fled to the UK where she worked on behalf of wartime prisoners, seeking compensation for them. At the time of her death in 1957, she was 73 years old and lived in a flat in Kensington. Prior to the attack that led to her death on May 24, 1957, Teresa told friends that she had been to the police to tell them that she felt threatened and that her life could be at risk. However, further details of why she felt threatened or who was threatening her remain unknown. The night of her murder, Teresa was on her way home from having dinner with friends and yelling. A member of staff on duty at the Gloucester Road Underground Station heard footsteps on the emergency stairs at around 10.20 p.m. This wasn't an uncommon sound, as people who wanted to avoid paying for tickets would often try and sneak by using the stairs. However, shortly after the sound of footsteps, a woman's voice shouted, Bandit! Somewhat alarmed, the member of staff went to investigate and found a woman who was tall and white-haired walking slowly to the left. Noting her frailty, the staff member offered her his arm and helped her to the left, asking what about bandits. Teresa then replied, I have been knifed. It was then that the staff member noticed blood running down the front of her jacket. He asked where the bandit was, but Teresa told him that she didn't know. At street level, Emergency services were called, and Teresa was put in the temporary care of the station inspector. A passing detective constable accompanied the woman to St. Mary's Hospital, and en route, she told him, I was on the platform, then stabbed. Teresa died shortly after arriving at the hospital. The team of investigating officers searched the train station but were unable to come up with any murder weapons. They also found there to be no blood anywhere but near the lift meaning that they couldn't locate just where exactly the murder took place. As authorities searched for a motive behind the killing, they ruled out robbery since nothing was stolen from Teresa. They also thought that a well-lit platform in a public place wasn't a likely place to carry out premeditated murder, and that a small knife, like the one that created Teresa's five stab wounds, was unlikely to be used for an assassination. Although the train Teresa rode was identified, Either the guard nor the driver saw anything or anyone suspicious. The adjacent tunnels were searched, but no new leads came off this. It's theorized that the murderer escaped via the emergency stairs. Investigators worked tirelessly on Teresa's case. 
London Transport Police traced bus drivers and conductors in the area at the time. A total of 214 Piccadilly Line trains were examined. Hundreds of railway staff were interviewed, including 64 train crews. Every knife found over the next few months was given to the police so it could be forensically looked over. At an inquest held on the 19th of August, 1957, it was found that a huge 18,000 people had been interviewed by the police during the course of the investigation. The verdict of the inquest was, unsurprisingly, murder by person slash persons unknown. Polish-speaking police officers intermingled with guests at Teresa's funeral and prompt an oratory, listening out for any clues or culprits to reveal themselves. But nothing came of this attempt at finding answers. Several suspects were identified in Teresa's murder, including a school worker who had turned up the next morning with a black eye and scratches on his face. But this lead did not appear to pan out. A man seen loitering in the station days prior to the attack was traced and located, but it turns out he was in psychiatric care at the time of the crime. Despite the extensive and thorough investigation by authorities, the murder of Teresa Lepensk remains unsolved. Asia Jaquila Degree, known to her family and peers simply as Asia, was a curious, empathetic, and sensitive young girl. Her deep-rooted love for family, school activities, and innocent youthful passion for basketball was cut short by an unexplainable, unsolved disappearance in the early morning hours of Valentine's Day, 2000, leaving all who knew her across her hometown of Shelby, North Carolina, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As I hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence, and situational analysis. This is an examination of the disappearance of Asia Degree and the trail of clues near the woods along State Highway and C-180. On February 14, 1988, a Valentine's Day full of endless joy, the energy of true love, and excitement for the future saw the happy couple of Harold and Akella Degree get married. Two years later, on August 5, 1990, the husband and wife gave birth to a little girl, Asia, and soon, the couple became a family of four, adding a baby boy named O'Brien. The degrees stuck to their roots in Shelby, North Carolina, and blossomed as a close-knit family in their cozy residential home in the northern rural area, west of Charlotte. Both Harold and Akella worked regular daytime jobs, making Asia and O'Brien latchkey kids once they reached the age to attend school. This youthful independence didn't deter the children. However, the parents were 100% comfortable trusting Fulton Elementary School's efforts to return their son and daughter safely home. Asia specifically understood the security needed to navigate after-school loneliness and was wary of strangers, even as a toddler, from kindergarten onwards. Harold and Akella knew their children would be at home completing homework, or chores when they returned from their respective workplaces. As Asia's mind flourished in an educational environment, so did her interests and personalities. While she spent a bulk of her free time at home, she did involve herself in extracurricular activities at Fulton, joining the local youth basketball league. Through patience, teamwork, and an innocently competitive spirit, Asia quickly developed into a star point guard for her age often lifting her teammates to greatness. In fact, two days before her disappearance, Asia played in a league basketball game. Her team was undefeated at the time but suffered the first loss the day after Asia fouled out of the game because of her competitive fire and love for her teammates. She and the other girls cried as a result but quickly mastered their resolve soon after and supported O'Brien in his own basketball game. It was a perfect example of Asia's skill passion, and sympathy. Despite her academic and athletic duality, Asia was still quite reserved back at home. Her mother and father were quite suspicious of the world back in the late 1990s and the effects of new technology, specifically the internet, on young children's developing brains. Thus, the couple decided to focus on raising their son and daughter, mostly around the extended family, their church community, and local schools. Instead of an electronic atmosphere, as a byproduct of these methods, 
the degree household did not include a computer. Akala reasoned that, at the time, the nightly news seemed to have a daily storm about pedophiles coaxing young minds via the internet. Nevertheless, Asia didn't mind the lack of technology, already cautious and shy in bigger social climates. She was more than okay with settling within the parameters of her parents' close watch and never strayed far from good behavior. It was this simple, if not hyper-secure, way of living that made Asia's disappearance that much more puzzling. She showed zero signs of disturbance or inclination to up and leave. Her intense fear of dogs led her parents to believe she didn't even like leaving the house in rule when it could be avoided. Regardless, when Harold and Nikita woke up to celebrate their 12th year anniversary in marriage, the joy, love, and excitement from 1983 were replaced with trepidation, mystery, and helpless terror. On Valentine's Day 2000, Asia Degree vanished. The mystery begins on February 11, 2000. It's a Friday, and the Degree siblings Asia and O'Brien had the day off from school. They go to their Aunt Keisha's house just down the street in their home neighborhood and later to their respective basketball practices. The following day, on Saturday, February 12th, Asia and her youth basketball team suffer their first loss of the season. The loss upsets Asia and her friends, who walk around the court faking injuries before a fellow teammate asks them to stop. Asia eventually comes around and understands the situation, reverting back to a normal south later in the day. In the evening, Asia sleeps over at her cousin's slumber party, where the girls watch television late into the night. On Sunday, February 13th, Harold and Akita Degree pick up their daughter, and the family attends church. Immediately following, they go to the residence of another cousin, Shelanda Brown, where Asia's grandmother gives her cologne and candy. Exhausted from the slumber party, Asia returns home and goes to bed at 6.30 p.m. Her rest is disturbed a couple of hours later when a gusty thunderstorm hits the Shelby area. Asia heads to the living room to watch television with her parents. At around 9 p.m., a motorcycle crash in the neighborhood takes down power lines, causing the Degree household to lose electricity. Akita wakes up, who sleeps on the couch, and tells him to move the kerosene lamp. Harold can't go back to sleep and watches more TV, later checking on Asia and O'Brien, who were both soundly asleep in their beds at 2.30 a.m. Sometime in the very early a.m. hours, Bryant Degree wakes up and hears his sister stirring in bed. At one point, hearing her climb out of bed and walk to the bathroom, it is unconfirmed whether or not he heard Asia return. It's between this moment and 4 a.m. on February 13, 2000, that Asia grabs her backpack stuffed with clothes and sneaks out of her room, her family none the wiser. At 5.45 a.m., Akita awakens to get her children up and ready for Monday morning classes. However, when she checks the kids' bedroom, she finds O'Brien asleep and Asia's bed empty. She soon finds the rest of the house void of her daughter's presence and restlessly searches the nooks and crannies of their home. Harold soon joins the immediate search, and when they find Asia's set of house keys are also missing, they call her grandmother, who lives across the street. The grandmother informs them that she never saw or heard from Asia. Harold and Akita are left to walk up and down the street, screaming their daughter's name, desperate and afraid. When no trace can be found in the first hour of their search, the degree couple calls the police at 6.39 a.m. Authorities show no hesitation and arrive on the scene six months later. They comb the neighborhood, find zero clues, and aside from the situation, it isn't even bigger than originally thought. The sheriff's office calls in search dogs, rescue ops, special detectives, and the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigations. At 2 p.m., the degree residence is taped off by state investigators, who find there are no signs of forced entry, forced exit, or foul play from anywhere inside the home. Through the search of Asia's bedroom and belongings, with the help of Akita's familiar recognition, they build the inventory of Asia's missing items that she most likely brought with her. This consists of a red vest, blue jeans with a red stripe, a white shirt, a black and white shirt, 
black overalls with the Tweety Bird image, a black Tweety Bird pocketbook, Candy Andrew Houskies. Later that afternoon, two truck drivers come forward with stories about potential Asia sightings from earlier that morning. The first man, Jeff R., states he saw a little girl walking along North Carolina Highway 18 in a downpour at approximately 3.30 a.m. His location was just over a mile south of Asia's house. The second man, retired sheriff's deputy Roy B., along with his son, saw what they first thought to be a short-statured woman at 4.15 a.m. walking down Highway 18, just before the Highway 180 intersection. This was also about a mile south of Asia's house. And Royce sent out an alert to fellow truck drivers to keep their eyes open. After he circled back a few times to get a better glimpse of the wandering figure, she ran off the road and into the nearby woods. This would be the last known, though unconfirmed, sighting of Asia degree. After Jeff and Roy came forward with their leads, investigators set up a five-mile radius surge in the woods near Highway 18, and Highway 180. Unfortunately, the weather takes away the bloodhound's abilities to pick up any scent, and the muddy search turns up nothing. When the sun goes down that Valentine's Day, Harold and Akita are interviewed by State Bureau. They are quickly ruled out as suspects and fully cooperate with police. The first major clue in the case comes the following day on February 15th. A volunteer search team asks Shelby citizens Rayleigh and Debbie Turner if they can check their property for signs of Asia, considering their property was a mile south of the degrees and somewhat close to the highway sighting marks. The Turner couple happily obliges and opens their door structure in their backyard where old furniture was stored. In it, they discover candy wrappers, a green marker, a 1996 Atlanta Olympics pencil, and a small photograph of a young girl that looks very much like Asia. These items are classified as evidence and thought to be artifacts from Asia's backpack she took with her. Another day passes before police arrive on the scene at the Turners on February 16th. They hand over the little photograph but theorize the house is too far for Asia to stumble upon. Another one of their neighbors, Reverend Mackey Turner, says that his beagles usually barked whenever a stranger approached his home but they were quiet on Valentine's morning. On February 17th, investigators find more candy wrappers around the Turner residence, and the couple turns over the rest of their findings. Police then interview other families of the girls on Asia's basketball team and confirm the candy wrappers match the candy handed out to the players from Asia's basketball game that previous Saturday. However, None of the degree family members nor Fulton Elementary School students recognize the young girl in the watch photograph, and it's decided while related to the investigation, the photo is not that of Asia degree. After three more days of exhaustive searches, authorities scale back the hunt and end the official search on February 20, 2000. In a twofold act, a part of the law enforcement investigation, March 22 produced the next two updates. First, supporters erect a missing person's billboard at the exact spot the truck driver saw Asia run into the woods of Highway 18. Second, police announced they've interrogated a bevy of potential suspects ranging from degree family friends to sex offenders in the area. During these interviews, the authorities build a psychological profile of a possible abductor but never release it to the public in hopes to protect Asia. The next major clue is unearthed by grading contractor Terry on August 2, 2001, a year and a half since Asia vanished. He is etching the driveway on the side of a hill, on his tractor hits a clunky object covered with dark plastic. He cracks it open and finds a black book bag inside with an unknown name and address. Without cell service, but an unsettling feeling, Terry cannot contact anyone but writes the information down. The morning after, on August 3rd, Terry gives the name and address to his wife, who recognizes the info and tells Terry to call the police because the credentials belong to Asia Degree. Officials arrive on the scene and discover the book bag had been wrapped in two trash bags and intentionally buried long before the unearthing. The Bureau would not directly identify what exactly is in the book bag but says it's 95% Asia's possessions and the Charlotte Observer reports the contents included clothes and school supplies. 
A new search is soon put forth on August 15th, but the terrible condition of both the terrain and weather makes it almost unbearable. The three-mile-long ding turns up little outside of some animal skeletons and a pair of man's khaki pants, items either confirmed nor denied to have a relation to Asia's case. Another massive search goes underway in October of 2001, this time combing a six-mile stretch down Highway 18. It would later be the first portion of a lengthy 26-mile-long trail of sleuthing from Asia's home to the book bag excavation site, and still turns up no clues. Over the next decade or so, authorities interview countless suspects, nearby criminals searching endlessly across North Carolina and the lands linked to Asia and her family's past. In May 2016, Investigators say they're looking for a dark green 1970s Ford Thunderbird or Lincoln Mark IV with rusty wheel wells. How or why the car connects to Asia is unknown, but it's still a current major point of interest. The biggest clues of all, however, pop up later in October of 2018. Investigators from the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office release a video pinpointing two major pieces of evidence they're seeking information about giving zero context or details, but claiming these items have advanced a meticulous search for Asia degree. Because of how tightly wound the entire investigation has been kept, vital pieces of evidence are hard to signify, important only by the word of police through the funneling of local media. Thus, the most important case point can only be the most recent, providing a fresh chance for someone to come forward with a lead that could solve the mystery. The following is the exact video the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office released last October in 2018, pleading for public knowledge regarding two clues surfaced in the search. While the background to Dr. Zeus's book and t-shirt are unknown, the ambiguity still holds weight to the case. They can most certainly be connected, but they can also be wholly separate from one another. So even if you only know something about one half of the equation, do not hesitate to shed light on these peculiar subjects. Early on in the case, many Shelby residents and interested onlookers pondered if Asia woke up in the middle of the night and decided to leave and announce on her own authority. Many of these supporters couldn't get past the situation of a packed book bag with so much clothing and candy. It certainly seems as if Asia was planning for a nine-year-old's idea of an adventure, making sure she had her favorite outfits and plenty of candy to provide the sugar and energy necessary for an imaginative quest. What was missing from the theory was any clear motive and sensible reasoning to explain a single-digit aged girl leaving a simple, sufficient life. While Asia had more of a sheltered childhood, she loved the friendly conclusion and was still able to maintain a healthy social life and extracurricular activities at school. She was close with her family, both in personal relationships and geographic proximity, and obviously found tight-knit friendships in her cousins and fellow peers on her basketball team. There were no reports of youthful rivalries or bullying, and Harold and Akila provided everything their children needed. Thus, if Asia did leave as a runaway child, it was for a completely unexpected and reasonable reason. Maybe she had a goal, only she was aware of as the result of a creative young mind, or maybe it was the result of an unknown sinister encounter she had the previous weekend. Maybe she made instant plans to meet a friend or even a stranger for a Valentine's Day engagement, and packed the only way she knew how, instructed to leave before dawn at the ignorance of her parents and brother. It's a hard theory to swallow, considering the complete lack of supporting evidence, and the fact that Asia had little connection to anyone outside of her controlled circle. The idea of a potential kidnapping spawned whispered speculation about Asia's disappearance as well. Obviously, police ruled it out right away after a few detailed inspections of the degree children's bedroom, and exit routes proved foul play was a non-factor. Of course, there's always a possibility that an abductor was stealthy enough to get in and out, careful not to leave fingerprints or any trail behind. Or as a few corners of the internet like to hypothesize, the culprit came from within the household, placing suspicion on Harold Degree himself. The theory is based on the fact that Harold was the last person to see his daughter, spent most of the evening away from his wife on the couch, 
and made an unscheduled trip to the grocery store late at night. However, the circumstantial facts end there. Asia's father and the entire family, for that matter, have denied any such rumors or conspiracies. They point to Harold's underlying love for Asia, apparent throughout her young life. He, along with Akila, has spent hundreds of dollars, thousands of hours, and never-ending energy looking for their precious daughter. He has cooperated with police investigations and was ruled out by the authorities very early on and, for what it's worth, passed polygraph tests. While it's easy to point fingers at physical people with faces we can see, it's more than likely a figure yet to be identified who took Asia's life into their own hands. Still keeping an abductor theory in mind, some internet sleuths wonder if a serial killer was involved. North Carolina has had its share of murderous minds, such as the Edgecombe County serial killer. But very few line up their insidious activity with the timeline of Asia's disappearance. The one interesting possibility is Scott Williams, a serial killer who murdered three women spanning 10 years in 1997, 2004, and 2006. The homicides took place near Monroe, North Carolina, only a couple of counties over from Cleveland County and the Degrees hometown of Shelby. Scott Williams' whereabouts in late 1999 are unknown. However, he was also charged with kidnapping and rape against two other women in 1995 and most interestingly in 2000, yet considering all of the potential in Scott's history and criminal inclinations. His modus operandi doesn't match Asia's profile. Scott mostly preyed upon middle-aged white women and had no prior incidents with young African-American girls. Also, because he was entering into the criminal database of the United States Justice Department, his DNA and fingerprints would be available to match if the investigators on Asia's case discovered either type of evidence in their hunt for answers. It's more than likely Scott Williams is a circumstantial suspect holding little weight in the lineup of theoretical suspects. In terms of other possible serial killers or murderers, the sad fact of the matter is, many cases involving African-American children, teenagers, and women are left unsolved, unaccounted for, and kept out of the media. Thus, evaluating patterns and creating a database for killers with similar profiled victims doesn't exist, leaving the world to ponder if there was indeed a serialized string of kidnapped black females in the Carolinas at the turn of the millennia left in the mud and forgotten or worse ignored. Before we divulge our hypothesis of Asia's unsolved disappearance, we want to make known our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video, and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe, research, and report. In regards to the nine-year-old girl who vanished without a trace on Valentine's Day of 2000, we believe an explanation derives as a combination of the theories discussed in the previous segment. The seemingly intentional packing of her book bag leads us to figure Asia did indeed leave the household on her own. Why? It's nearly impossible to fathom. Whether or not someone asked her to leave is too vague of an assumption to try and hone in on the details but still a curious speculation. Then, sometime after leaving her house, Asia lost herself along the North Carolina highways and wandered into the woods. Meandering without a call or comfort and surviving on the candy she packed. Somewhere along the way, she probably ran into something sinister or rather someone sinister ran into her. It's at this point Asia's trail goes cold, most likely taken against her will in the clutches of an unidentified shadow. There are zero signs pointing to either life or death, but with resounding optimism, there is a chance Asia's heartbeat just the same as it did 19 years ago. In the end, the stronger conclusions rest within the clues presented by detectives in October of 2008, the Dr. Zeus's children's book, Mac Elliott's Pool, and the concert t-shirt for the pop band New Kids on the Block. There's a good possibility that either these items were found in Asia's book bag recovered in August of 2001, or that these items were confirmed to be in the Degrees household when Asia went missing but disappeared afterwards. 
All these items recovered separately and tested positive with Asia's DNA. We believe Asia's DNA was, in fact, found on the book, as well as other sets of unidentified DNA. Asking people to come forward who may have checked the book out from the library or known someone to have touched it at some point would help investigators inquire about further DNA testing. The same can be hypothesized with the shirt. In a similar scenario, the sheriff's deputy might not actually have the shirt and evidence but have proof that Asia owned one at the time of her disappearance, and finding one out in the public could bring a new suspect and find new leads via testimony or DNA data. In conjunction with the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office and their newly presented clues, we plead for anyone with a connection to the book or the shirt to come forward with information. Even if it seems trivial, nonsensical, or completely unrelated to Asia's case, you never know when the key will come from within the cracks. The Degree family is certain Asia is still alive out there in the world and is hopeful to learn of her fate in their own lifetimes. With the help of a wider audience, Harold and Akila can find a growing optimism in their 19-year-old wish. A wish to reunite with their bubbling daughter, her wish to find the spark of delight in their lives that was Asia Degree so passionate about her friends and her family, and growing as an individual. A wish to give their missing child the potential she had so many years ago to experience a full life completed with hopes and dreams, successes and trials, lessons and laughter and love. And regardless of how it's achieved, let's shed some light on Asia Degree's mystery and make sure that next Valentine's Day, Harold and Akila returned to the days where the anniversary was defined by joy and excitement, a day full of family bonding, a February 14th void of confusion and sponsored by Closure. If you like this case, you can join our family by subscribing our channel. We are so close to get 1000's family members, let's continue. Formed into a homicide cold case. In the summer of 2015, Ebby's life takes a 180-degree transformation. She picks up a job at a nearby footlocker, enters an unapproved relationship by her mother and stepfather, moves out of their home, enrolls at a public school for her senior year, and displays increasing agitation towards both her personal and social life as the leaves change colors and the warmth of summer turns to the chill of autumn. Ebby continues to worry her friends and family by missing more school than she ever has in her past skipping classes for unknown reasons. The pattern of truancy peaks on Wednesday, October 21st. Danielle, Ebby's friend whom she has been staying with at the time, texts Ebby, informing her that she'd be running late for her doctor's appointment. And if Ebby needed to leave for school by herself, that would be okay. Ebby was supposed to drive Danielle to her own charter school called the Lisa Academy, but Abby responded with a text that read, no, it's not a big deal at all. I swear. I really didn't want to go today anyway because there's all that drama. Danielle would later say that she had no clue what drama Abby could be referencing. Despite this, the friends still got together later that evening and were in good spirits per usual. Two days later, on the night of Friday, October 23rd, Abby attends a party by herself. Danielle later mentioned that she didn't go because she didn't know any of the other attendees, hinting that the crowd was familiar only to Abby. During the festivities, Abby was allegedly gang-raped by four men, recorded by one of their cell phone cameras. The next morning on Saturday, October 24th, Abby returns to her mother's home, where she informs both Lori and her stepfather, Michael, about the sexual assault. Abby demands to go to the police station to report the crime and asks the adults to accompany her. Lori and Michael agree and ask if they can meet her at the police station later in the day. As the morning shifts to the afternoon, Abby tells Danielle that she needs to stay at her older brother Trevor's house to provide him reassurance because he was worrying about her extended absence. Before Abby leaves Trevor's place, however, she visits her grandparents, watches television while laying in bed, a little while later, and they eat dinner together before venturing out for frozen yogurt. At around 8 p.m., Abby bids farewell to her grandparents, telling them she must meet up with her stepfather, Michael, and plans on returning to spend the night. 
This is in contrast to what Abby told Danielle earlier that day, but her grandparents keep their door open nonetheless. Evening shifts tonight, and Lori and Michael haven't heard back from their daughter. They try calling her cell phone but receive no response. Michael theorizes Abby when looking for the alleged cell phone video on her own. Cell phone records indicate that during this time, Abby sent multiple texts to the four men she accused of rape from Friday's party. No contact is made to or by Abby until the following afternoon at 2 p.m. on Sunday, October 25th. Abby calls her brother Trevor on the phone and comes across as disoriented according to him. At first, Abby says she's out in front of Trevor's house, but when he walks outside, he sees no sign of his sister. The connection is lost, and when he calls Abby back and demands to know where she is, she said she was in her car but wasn't sure where she parked exactly and wouldn't divulge who she was with. Abby then says, I messed up, and the phone clicks off. This would be the last known contact anyone would make with Abby. By the time the sun sets on Sunday night, Abby is reported missing by her parents. However, the police wait 12 hours after her last point of contact before engaging in an official investigation, per department procedures. Meanwhile, Danielle acts out of fear and drives around the town, searching all the spots she and Abby would hang out in hopes of finding a clue. Three days after that final phone call to Trevor on Wednesday, October 28th, a security guard patrolling a parking lot near a wooded area of a Little Rock neighborhood recreational ground called Charlemagne Park discovers Abby's 2003 Volkswagen Versailles. When the Volkswagen is still in the same position two days later, law enforcement comes in on October 30th to search the car. They confirm Abby's ownership, find the gas tank empty, the battery dead, the key in the ignition, and Abby's phone, wallet, and contact lenses sitting in the front seats. The investigation continues. A few days pass by, and Abby's good friend Kaylee and her mother Aji Foley catch a putrid smell of decomposition emanating from a sewage drain near Charlman Park in their own search for clues. After multiple calls to Little Rock Police Department, detectives assigned to the case finally arrive back on the scene but disregard the Foley's claims stating they had already completed an intense search of the area and their cadaver dogs would have picked up on any human decomposition. They assume the smell is that of an animal, and the follies are pushed away. In November of the same year, Abby's family urges the public to aid in the search for her and offers a $3,000 reward for any applicable leads. Volunteers, work pizza, and in April of 2016, Search and rescue efforts combed the woods near Markham Street and Bowman Road. Nothing of note was found. Five months later, in November of 2016, police once again searched Charlemagne Park for three consecutive days but still find nothing. In May of 2017, authorities theorized the case is most likely a homicide, and a month later, the Stepuck family increases their reward for information to $50,000. In October of the same year, the Stepak family hired an additional private investigator, T.J. Ward, who worked on the high-profile Natalie Holloway case in Aruba. They gained an international following when Dr. Phil interviews Lori and Trevor weeks later in December of 2017. Investigators reach a major breakthrough in May of 2018 when another surge through Charman Park upends skeletal remains from a drainage pipe. Please immediately send the bones in for testing and soon reveal they are the confirmed remains of Abby Stepak. In October of 2018, three years to the date after Abby disappeared, law enforcement announces that the medical examiner discovered Abby's preliminary cause of death but would not release any further details or what the COD result was due to the case still being an open homicide investigation. As of today, there will be no further updates. However, Please are still inviting anyone with information to come forward. When looking at the grand scheme of Ebby Stepp's case, it's difficult to pinpoint any massive clues or weighted leads. But under a microscope, there is one corner of the evidence bank that could withhold keys to unlocking both who Ebby was in contact with before she disappeared and with how the initial investigation was muddied with inconsistencies. Despite this, the friends still got together later that evening and were in good spirits per usual. 
Two days later, on the night of Friday, October 23rd, Abby attends a party by herself. Danielle later mentioned that she didn't go because she didn't know any of the other attendees, hinting that the crowd was familiar only to Abby. During the festivities, Abby was allegedly gang-raped by four men, recorded by one of their cell phone cameras. The next morning on Saturday, October 24th, Abby returns to her mother's home, where she informs both Lori and her stepfather, Michael, about the sexual assault. Abby demands to go to the police station to report the crime and asks the adults to accompany her. Lori and Michael agree and ask if they can meet her at the police station later in the day. As the morning shifts to the afternoon, Abby tells Danielle that she needs to stay at her older brother Trevor's house to provide him reassurance because he was worrying about her extended absence. Before Abby leaves Trevor's place, however, she visits her grandparents, watches television while laying in bed a little while later, and they eat dinner together before venturing out for frozen yogurt. At around 8 p.m., Abby bids farewell to her grandparents, telling them she must meet up with her stepfather, Michael, and plans on returning to spend the night. This is in contrast to what Abby told Danielle earlier that day, but her grandparents keep their door open nonetheless. Evening shifts tonight, and Lori and Michael haven't heard back from their daughter. They try calling her cell phone but receive no response. Michael theorizes Abby when looking for the alleged cell phone video on her own. Cell phone records indicate that during this time, Abby sent multiple texts to the four men she accused of rape from Friday's party. No contact is made to or by Abby until the following afternoon at 2 p.m. on Sunday, October 25th. Abby calls her brother Trevor on the phone and comes across as disoriented according to him. At first, Abby says she's out in front of Trevor's house, but when he walks outside, he sees no sign of his sister. The connection is lost, and when he calls Abby back and demands to know where she is, she said she was in her car but wasn't sure where she parked exactly and wouldn't divulge who she was with. Abby then says, I messed up, and the phone clicks off. This would be the last known contact anyone would make with Abby. By the time the sun sets on Sunday night, Abby is reported missing by her parents. However, the police wait 12 hours after her last point of contact before engaging in an official investigation, per department procedures. Meanwhile, Danielle acts out of fear and drives around the town, searching all the spots she and Abby would hang out in hopes of finding a clue. Three days after that final phone call to Trevor on Wednesday, October 28th, a security guard patrolling a parking lot near a wooded area of a Little Rock neighborhood recreational ground called Charlemagne Park discovers Abby's 2003 Volkswagen Versailles. When the Volkswagen is still in the same position two days later, law enforcement comes in on October 30th to search the car. They confirm Abby's ownership, find the gas tank empty, the battery dead, the key in the ignition, and Abby's phone, wallet, and contact lenses sitting in the front seats. The investigation continues. A few days pass by, and Abby's good friend Kaylee and her mother Aji Foley catch a putrid smell of decomposition emanating from a sewage drain near Charlemont Park in their own search for clues. After multiple calls to Little Rock Police Department, detectives assigned to the case finally arrive back on the scene but disregard the Foley's claims stating they had already completed an intense search of the area and their cadaver dogs would have picked up on any human decomposition. They assume the smell is that of an animal, and the follies are pushed away. In November of the same year, Abby's family urges the public to aid in the search for her and offers a $3,000 reward for any applicable leads. Volunteers, work pizza, and in April of 2016, Search and rescue efforts combed the woods near Markham Street and Bowman Road. Nothing of note was found. Five months later, in November of 2016, police once again searched Charlemagne Park for three consecutive days but still find nothing. In May of 2017, authorities theorized the case as most likely a homicide, and a month later, the Stepak family increases their reward for information to $50,000. In October of the same year, the Stepak family hired an additional private investigator, T.J. Ward, 
who worked on the high-profile Natalie Holloway case in Aruba. They gained an international following when Dr. Phil interviews Lori and Trevor weeks later in December of 2017. Investigators reach a major breakthrough in May of 2018 when another surge through Charman Park upends skeletal remains from a drainage pipe. Please immediately send the bones in for testing and soon reveal they are the confirmed remains of Abby Stepak. In October of 2018, three years to the date after Abby disappeared, law enforcement announces that the medical examiner discovered Abby's preliminary cause of death but would not release any further details or what the COD result was due to the case still being an open homicide investigation. As of today, there will be no further updates. However, Please are still inviting anyone with information to come forward. When looking at the grand scheme of Ebby Stepp's case, it's difficult to pinpoint any massive clues or weighted leads. But under a microscope, there is one corner of the evidence bank that could withhold keys to unlocking both who Ebby was in contact with before she disappeared and with how the initial investigation was muddied with inconsistencies. Many police departments across the country keep their 911 calls logged for years on end if not saving the entire audio files. Further complaints against the original investigators also highlight the lack of interviews with key players in the case. Ebby's grandparents, who were the last confirmed subjects to see her, were not interviewed for a year and a half after her disappearance. In addition, the security guard who found Abby's car was not contacted for an official interrogation by anyone on the case until a few months after the fact when the first private investigator, Mondi Vickers, interviewed him. The security guard actually revealed to Vickers that he had footage captured by a camera in his car that showed multiple instances of E.B. meeting an unidentified man in the same parking lot where her vehicle was left. These video recordings were years and years old, unfortunately, and were deleted before Abby vanished. But it's still inexplicable why the original authorities on the case wouldn't interview the security guard with such interesting vital information. Sadly, no further information is known about the guard or the mysterious parking lot man. All we can do is hope that the current investigators on EB's case consider all these issues and have returned to research the red flags raised by worried onlookers before we divulge our hypothesis of EB's unsolved murder. We want to make it known that conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video, and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. This case is especially confounding due to the major lack of published details or released documents for public analysis. On one hand, it makes perfect sense. The case is an open investigation, and law enforcement rarely discloses details of ongoing homicide cases to protect the victim, their family, and not let the perpetrator gain a leg up. 